Good morning. Well, as you're aware, um, we are in an Advent series, and uh, it is entitled Fall on Your Knees, and uh, the next couple of Sundays, we're going to be looking at uh, some various reasons why this is the right time to fall on our knees and praise God for who he is and what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll be looking at Jesus Christ as Emmanuel, God with us, and the present hope and comfort that we receive in Christ, and that's a reason why we should praise him. The week after that, the focus is on Christ as the glorious one, the one who is coming, and the hope that we have in the return of Christ, and how that uh, compels us to praise and worship him at this time of year. Today's focus, as you've already heard, is on what Christ did for us as our Savior. And it's not unusual, of course, for us to talk about Christ as Savior at Christmas time. We see it right in the biblical account, right? The angel told Joseph, he said about Mary, she will bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The very name of Jesus has the idea of saving right in, right in it. There's that famous Christmas passage in Luke 2 with that same theme. The angel said to the shepherds out in their fields, unto you is born this day a savior who is Christ the Lord. So if you have been using our Advent devotional, as Brennan mentioned, you've been seeing this theme over the past few days, Jesus Christ as Savior. And this morning, we want to focus our attention on one particular aspect of the saving work of Jesus. And I think when we comprehend this part of Jesus' saving work accurately, it really does transform how we worship and how we live, and how we celebrate the birth of Christ. So I want to give you the the premise of the sermon right up front. As believers in Christ, we tend to be very aware of what Jesus came to save us from. We know we're sinners. We know we deserve the judgment of God. We know Jesus came to save us from that judgment. But we don't always think clearly about what Christ came to save us to. The teaching of scripture is not just that Christ came to save us from our status as enemies of God and sinners, but also to transfer us to an entirely different status. Specifically, when we were still in our sins, we were slaves. And when we've been rescued from our sins by Christ, we become sons. And there there may not be a single person in this room myself included, who truly grasps all of what that means. But we're going to try this morning to look at it. Because we're actually in good, case, in good company. There is a, a church in the, uh, the early days of uh, after Jesus left, in the, the time of the apostles, that struggled with the same idea. And that's the church in Galatia. And I would invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. If you're using a pew Bible, I believe that's on page 974. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Galatia. And those believers in Galatia, no doubt, would have sung with us the same praises to God that we sing. They would have adored Christ the way we adore him. They would have been glad and rejoiced in being saved from their sins, just like we do. But in the way they lived their lives, in the way they were trying to relate to God, they made it evident that they didn't totally grasp what that meant. They were still trying to relate to God as if they were slaves and not as if they were sons. And the main symptom of that disease expressed itself in their attempt to relate to God through their performance, through law-keeping. And to relate to God through law-keeping is to live as if Jesus never came. It's to live as if Christmas never happened. 
I've given you there in your notes a, a three-point outline for us to follow this morning. Very simple. First of all, what we were, slaves to law-keeping. What God did, sent his son. And what we are, sons of God. What we were, what God did, and what we are. Let's start with what we were here in the first three, uh, three verses of Galatians chapter 4. What we were, slaves to law keeping. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, a little background here might help us understand what Paul is trying to tell us. In Paul's world, the moment of growing up, the moment of uh, officially becoming an adult was very important from a religious and legal standpoint. It was, it was actually much more dramatic and much more defining than it is for us today. Today, we, we kind of think of maybe turning 18 as the time when you become an adult because legally you go from being a minor uh, to being an adult. But I think we could admit that it really, it doesn't change a whole lot for us, right? Uh, nothing really happens on that day you turn 18 that is sort of life defining, at least not for most of us. I, uh, I was thinking this week trying to remember my 18th birthday and uh, I can't remember what I did on my 18th birthday. Um, and since that was only 10 years ago, it shouldn't be that, <laughs> that hard, but for some reason, um, I'm struggling to even remember. I was, I'm rounding there a little bit, but it was, it's about, about like that. But, but for cultures in biblical times, that wasn't the case. You would remember the day you were, you moved from a, a, a child to an adult. For a Jew, for a Jewish young man, that would happen sometime after their 12th birthday. They would go through a ceremony, and in that ceremony, they would literally pass from the status of child to the status of adult. And all the rights and responsibilities of being an adult Jewish man came upon them on that day. It was life-changing. But remember, Paul, Paul here isn't just a Jew, he's also a Roman a Roman citizen. And I actually think he's got Roman adulthood in mind here when he writes this passage. For the Romans, there was also a very definitive time for the coming of age of a son from a boy to a man. The difference though is for a Roman, that time was decided by the father. The father would fix the day, the time when the Roman boy would become a, an adult. And this would happen at a, at a feast or a festival known as the Liberalia. But it wasn't just that the, the, the boy became a man at the festival, he also became a true son of his father. Today we might sort of think of uh, when you, you go from being a child to an adult, you sort of outgrow being a son. We may think of it that way a little bit. I'm, I'm my own man now. But it was the reverse in ancient Rome. It was at the time when a boy was pronounced a man that he was actually formally adopted by his father as the son and the heir. A young man would exchange the clothing of childhood for a white toga, the clothing of a Roman man and a Roman citizen. This would happen on this particular date set by the father. So becoming a man in the ancient Roman world was extremely significant. It took you from the realm of, of no rights, not even a valid status as a son, to all the rights and freedoms of a full citizen under Roman law, and granted a man's status as his father's heir and representative. On the other hand, when a Roman child was a minor in the eyes of the law, his status was no different than a slave. Even if he was the future heir of a, of a vast estate, he didn't have access to that wealth. He had no freedom. He was under the guardianship of tutors and, and guardians and managers. Everything he did was controlled by adults over him, and those adults over him were oftentimes slaves themselves. And that Roman child had no more freedom than the slaves who were stewarding him. And the point Paul is making is that a child 
A Roman child, no matter how wealthy or important his father was, had no more rights or privileges than the very slaves who were caring for him. And in verse 3, when Paul says, in the same way also when we were children, he's comparing all of us who know Christ to what we were before Christ. Before Christ, even if we are, are religious, even if we are part of a church, even if we in some way, shape, or form know about God, we're no different than little Roman children who have no rights. We're no different than slaves. As a matter of fact, he says, Paul says right there in verse 3, when we were children, we were slaves. We're enslaved to the elementary principles of the, word, the world. That, that word elementary principles there, it's the, it's the Greek word for the ABCs. We're enslaved to the ABCs of the world. And Paul's referring to elementary teachings regarding rules and regulations, which is the way all kinds of people attempt by their own efforts to justify themselves before God. This is a way of achieving salvation by their own efforts. And this is elementary. We have a little four-year-old guy, Joel. And uh, we'll read him some stories or, or watch a movie. And he, he will often ask, is this person good or bad? You know, he's trying to, he's trying to figure it all out. And uh, I was just reading to him his children's Bible this week. And uh, it was the story of Abraham and Sarah. And on one page, you have Sarah there. And the story is saying that she didn't believe God's promise for, to her. And she laughed at God when God made this promise. And we turn the page, we keep reading the story. And the next page, there she is holding the promised baby. And she's got a smile on her face. And Joel, he's confused. She said, Dad, is, he, is she good or bad? And so, you know, I, I took a moment and sort of waxed eloquently about the promise of God, despite the fact Sarah's a sinner and, you know, the grace of God and so forth, and, you know, explained that to him. And he responded by saying, so is she good or bad? Like, <laughs> it, it didn't help anything. And really, that, that isn't unusual, right? That's, that's human nature. It's totally normal to think of in terms of good and bad and re relating to God on the basis of performance. We're born with a self-justifying nature. Grace is actually opposed to our nature, right? It's, it's opposed, it's contrary to our natural inclinations. That's why we not only have trouble receiving grace, that's why we have trouble granting grace. Before Christ, we're all slaves to some basic principle of the world and the flesh. In Paul's day, this was the case for the Jews who misunderstood the intent of the law and were in bondage to a, a performance mindset. But this was also the case for the Gentiles. The pagan religions had various ceremonies and rituals that they prescribed in order to achieve salvation. Either way, Jew or Gentile, men were putting themselves in bondage. This kind of approach is, is vain and fruitless and ultimately damning. Perhaps some of you have come out of a legalistic background. Maybe there was a, a veneer of the gospel, but your Christianity was one of doing the right things, following the right rules, looking good on the outside. Maybe even there was a genuine gospel reality there, but your own heart still sought to justify yourself before God by what you did, by your behavior. Now, is it, is it good to strive to live a godly life? Absolutely. We could even say it is necessary for a Christian to live a life characterized by holiness. That is true. But that holiness has to come from the inside out. It can't be imposed externally. We have to obey Christ because we love him and we love him because he has loved us. It can't be that we attempt to earn his love for us by doing good. That is a form of slavery. Any form of relating to God on the basis of our performance is a form of slavery. And it's because men and women were in bondage to this that Jesus was sent into the world. That is 
who we were. Let's talk about what God did, what God did. He sent his son. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Verse 4 starts with one of the most glorious ideas in scripture, but God, right? Our status is never the final word. Our lostness is never the end of the story. God is greater than whatever is keeping us from him. And so to eliminate what was keeping us from God, he sent his son. We read these words, born of a woman. Do you see that there in verse 4? Born of a woman. As soon as you see that phrase, you ought to think to Spencer's sermon last week. Genesis 3.15, man and woman fell into sin, and God made a promise that one day the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Jesus, born of a woman, is the, is the dragon slayer that God has sent. And he was born under the law, Paul says. He not only came to us, not only became one of us, but he submitted himself to the same principles we live under. He came under the law so he could free us from the law. Calvin said, he took upon himself the shackles of the law so that those who were shackled by the law could go free. It was a great exchange. And this happened, as Paul says, in the fullness of time. Like the Roman father who decides the time is right for his son to be a full adult member of society, God decided the time was right to send his son into the world. Now, humanly speaking, we can look at historical factors and say, this makes sense what Paul is saying here. The Christ came during what's known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. There was about a 200-year period when the, the Roman Empire, which was most of the civilized world at the time, uh, they were they're at a, a time of stability. Travel and commerce could occur in a way that, that hadn't been possible before. The Roman road system was, was well known, well kept, and people could travel throughout the empire. All the various parts of the Roman Empire were linked politically, physically, linguistically. Greek was the common language throughout the Roman Empire. So someone from Egypt and someone from Israel and someone from Turkey and someone from, from Gaul, from France, they could speak to one another. Religiously, you have the Jewish synagogue system that was in place, and that meant that every Christian evangelist in that first and second century who entered a city could find a place where they could stand up and preach the gospel to Jews and to Gentile proselytes. On the other hand, there was a great deal of spiritual hunger at that time. Even, even pagans recognized that though the, the Roman Empire was flourishing materially, it was not flourishing morally, and there was a spiritual hunger all of this meant that the timing was ideal for the spread of the message of the gospel at the time of Christ and the, the apostles. It was the fullness of time. Of course, beyond this, it's when God sent Jesus, right? So it's the right time. He always does everything in perfect timing. And so in God's timetable, the fullness of time had come when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary she'd give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. Now I want you to look at verse 5. There's a word there in verse 5. It's a word that we use in Christian circles all the time. That word redeem. And we may not always fully understand what that word means, but it's, it's an apt word for Paul to use here because it means to buy out of slavery. So you have a picture here of a wealthy man who walks into a slave market. He, he eyes a slave who's being auctioned and he enters the bidding and he wins the auction. And he walks up and pays the price and then he immediately sets the slave free. He purchased the slave not unto a new form of slavery, but he purchases the slave and buys him out of his slavery altogether. And all men were slaves to our own devices. And Christ walks into the slave market, as it were, and he pays the price to purchase every believer out of that slavery and set them free. 
Of course, that analogy doesn't work, right? Because he didn't pay with silver or gold, but paid with his own dear blood. And this is what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate what God did, sending his son to redeem us, to bring us out of the slavery of law-keeping, the slavery of performance. And that leads us to our last point. Number three, what we are. What we are. And that is sons of God. Sons of God. Verse six, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I used that slave auction analogy a little earlier there. And uh, it's got another problem. That, That analogy doesn't work in another way too. We only told part of the story. Uh, Jesus didn't walk into the slave market and just pay the price to set us free and off we go. If you look at the end of verse 5, so that we might receive adoption as sons. What Jesus did went beyond purchasing our freedom. It led to our adoption as sons. About uh, halfway through, a little less than halfway through the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln gave the Emancipation Proclamation which would go in effect January 1st, 1863 and set all slaves in the Confederate States free. He's known as the great emancipator because of that. There were a number of people who agreed with his position on slavery, but didn't agree with the Emancipation Proclamation. And part of the reason was there was a real concern for these slaves who would suddenly be set free and have no money, no land, no property, no way to make a living. They would be set free from slavery, but weren't set free to anything. And this is not the case with God's redemption. In Christ, we're freed from our bondage to law and sin, and then we're adopted as sons. So let's go back to the analogy. The man in the auction, the slave auction. He walks up and pays the price, purchases the man out of slavery, and then he turns to him and he says, tonight, my father is holding a feast. And at the feast, my father is going to adopt you as his son. So by the end of the day today, you will be equal to me in the sense of you will, you will have everything that I have. Everything that belongs to my father, we will share. You can call him dad like I call him dad. No one in the, in the empire is going to be able to touch you because you belong to the most powerful man in the empire. He is going to make you his son. That's what happens in the redemption we receive in Christ. It's not just a redemption from, it's a redemption unto from slavery unto sonship. And we who were once alienated from God by our sin have been brought right into his family. But we're not just made children of God. We are made sons of God. Now, hold with me here, okay? This might offend our egalitarian way of thinking, but there is a difference here. There is a word in, in, the, in Greek, there's a word in the New Testament for children, and that's used at times to refer to us. So uh, 1 John 3, behold, what manner of love the, God, the, the Father has given unto us, that we should become children of God, and such we are, right? That's the word children. It's not the word Paul uses here. He says we receive the adoption as sons of We become children by regeneration, but we become sons by adoption. And as sons, we have all the rights and privileges of the son. We enjoy the privileges and the freedoms and the responsibilities of being full-fledged sons of God. We enjoy the inheritance that our father has given to our elder brother, Jesus Christ. This is the, the privilege and the gift that we celebrate at Christmas. You, you might still be a relatively new believer. 
You, you might be a babe in Christ. Maybe you haven't been walking with the Lord for very long and you've got a lot of growing to do. But as far as your position in Christ goes, you are an adult son who has access to all that the Father has. And you can enjoy all the privileges of sonship. This means that God is for you. The God of the universe is not against you, not holding you at arm's length. He's not waiting to see how well you're going to do. He's made you a son. Do you remember what, what the father said to Jesus at his baptism? He called him his beloved son, right? And by being in Christ, we are beloved sons of the father. Maybe this was at least partially what Paul had in mind in Romans 8 when he said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We inherit all things that belong to Christ because we are sons of God. It's, it's almost too good to be true, right? And yet, there it is in black and white in the word of God. And the proof that you are his son is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. And notice what Paul says that that does for us. He enables, he enables us to cry, Abba, Father. And you want to know where the real privilege of being a son of God comes fully to light? It's right here. We don't fully grasp just how significant it is when Paul says we cry out, Abba, Father, to God himself. The idea of addressing God as Father was immensely unusual in Jesus' day, to put it mildly. No one ever personally addressed God that way. That's why Jesus' prayers flabbergasted people, right? The disciples listened to Jesus pray, and then what did they say? Lord, teach us to pray like that. That's not how we learn to pray. He was calling God his father. Every recorded prayer by Jesus in the Gospels, except one, has him calling God his father, and no one did that. This was something new. They, the disciples had no concept of going to God as if he was their father, as if they had the privilege as sons to go right up to him and talk to him and ask for something. This was mind-boggling. But that's how Jesus prayed, and that's how he taught his disciples to pray. When you pray, pray like this, our Father. This was new. This, this assumed a relationship and an intimacy. It assumed acceptance and grace and mercy and love. But you notice what Paul does here? He doubles down. It isn't just that we call God Father, but that we call him Abba. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. But this word, Abba, is an Aramaic word that Paul writes without translating it into Greek. Uh, when someone knows more than one language, it isn't unusual for them to resort to their heart language when they're really expressing emotion, right? I, I only speak one language, so I can't relate. But uh, when, when you're around folks who speak more than one language, when, when great emotion comes out, it would be typical to default to the language that is dearest to your heart. This is why, of course, we have missionaries working on Bible translation. The Weisses in Tanzania are translating uh, the Bible into a, a local heart language, into a mother tongue. And here, Paul, when he's talking about God as his father, he can't help but insert the word from his native Aramaic, the, word, the, the language he would have used in his home. And he says, Abba. And Abba was the word that a young child would use to refer to his father. It was a term of tenderness and familiarity. Now, let's think about this for a moment. What word does a young child use to refer to his father? Daddy, Papa, are about as close as we can come in English. And look, I am with you. Those words don't seem appropriate for us to refer to the God of the universe, right? The one who's a consuming fire. The one who will judge the living and the dead. But why? 
What exactly are we saying? Like if we use the right terminology, God is less holy. We have less problem approaching him if we use bigger words. Maybe we say, Father, right? He, he will hear us. He doesn't hear the prayers of those who are in rebellion against him, no matter what terminology they use. But if you're in Christ, you may call him dad because you are his son. That's what Paul is saying here. And I, I don't think we understand sonship. I don't think I understand just how significant it is that we've been adopted and given all the rights which belong to the son of God himself. If you have dared to believe the gospel, then you must dare to believe that your relationship to God is as a precious son to a loving father. And you might outgrow calling your own dad, daddy. But let's never outgrow calling God that. He is our dear, precious father. And that's how Paul concludes in verse 7. He says, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And we miss just a little bit in English. In verse 6, it's in the plural. You see it there. Because you are sons. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Right? But in verse 7, he goes to the singular. It's, it's as if he wants to address each and every person in the Galatian church. So you and you and you are no longer a slave, but a son. And you, you, and you, and you, and you are an heir through God. This is what God has done for us in Christ. This is what he has done for us at Christmas. You are no longer a slave, but a son of God. You're no longer a little child, but a full-grown adult son with all the privilege of having God as your father. You're an heir with Christ. And let me close with two points of application. One of those, one is for those of you who are in Christ. For those who have been born again. If you're a Christian, you know why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Jesus' birth because it's he who has purchased our redemption. It is he who has borne our sins and secured our salvation. You know that you can't be saved by works. You know that you're saved purely by God's grace through faith in Christ. He's redeemed you from the curse by his death for us. And yet, and yet, you and I are tempted to do what the Galatians were temp being tempted to do, to turn back to the very slavery that you were redeemed from. For the Galatians, it was the slavery of laws and regulations. For some of you, it's the same. It's the slavery of performance. Maybe it's relating to God purely on the basis of, of rules, believing that true Christianity is merely keeping all the rules. And the Apostle Paul would say to you the same thing he said to the Galatians here. A few verses down from our passage, he says, why would you turn back to those elementary principles and become slaves again? You are sons. Live as sons. This Christmas, fall on your knees and praise God that he sent his son to redeem you out of slavery and bring you into adoption as sons. A friend of mine recently told me that uh, the, the greatest propellant toward holiness for him has been the realization that he's been adopted into God's family. And now he's saying, why, why would I go down the road of sin when I belong in the family of God, why would I want to dishonor my father who has loved me so well? And I think the surest motive to holy living is also the greatest reason for joyful living. You've been rescued from the slavery of performance and have been brought into God's family. And if you're not yet a Christian, if you've not yet been born again, I want to tell you this morning, you do not have to remain a slave. This could be the first Christmas where all of this talk about peace and joy actually makes sense. You can know God, and you can know God as one of his sons if you'll bow your knee and worship Christ. A little earlier I mentioned that every prayer, every time Jesus prayed, he addressed God as Father, except once. And that was on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?
Jesus, the Son of God, co-equal with the Father, co-eternal with God, was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. He was condemned so that you could be accepted. He died so you could live. C.S. Lewis said, the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. So fall on your knees. Confess your need for him. Cry out to him for mercy. And believe that Jesus Christ, the one whose birth we're singing about, died for you. And you too can be redeemed from your sin and made into a son of God. Let's pray. Father, we do call you Father. Because that is what you are to us, a dear Father. One that we might even dare to call Dad, Papa. This isn't because of any worthiness on our part, but because you have been gracious toward us. You have loved us with a love that is beyond our comprehension. You've given us a status of your children that is beyond our understanding. So we praise you for what you have done for us in sending Christ. We're humbled at the cost that was required for Christ to redeem us from our slavery and make us into your children. Father, help us, help us Christmas season to revel in our status as your sons. Lord, keep us from falling back into the bondage of legalism. May your spirit motivate us to live lives that bring honor to you because we love you and remind us that even our love for you is only a response to your love for us. And Father, if there are those this morning who can't rightly call you Father because they've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, And we pray this morning that you would open their eyes and soften their hearts. That this Christmas might be the first Christmas they ever celebrate as your dear children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The angels said to the shepherds, peace on earth. Church, go in peace because you belong to the family of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.